I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a predominantly Oregon perspective, but uh, it definitely relates to uh, day neutral production here, giving you some mid to late season pest management uh, that we're finding uh, concerns of in, in day neutrals. So it's really important to think about day neutral production season as an extremely long season. When you're comparing it to something like a June bearing season that's really short, half of these um, insects don't even really have any game in June bearing production. But um, that's where integrated pest management really comes into play when you're looking at a day neutral production. You really need to look at biological, cultural, as well as chemical controls to manage that length of season because it's that much more of a concern. Uh, so thrips, lagus bug, spotted wing drosophila, even two spotted spider might all have just a different, you know, have a different perspective or a different spin in day neutral production. So a couple comments here to start off with. A lot of the threshold recommendations or um, other recommendations for treatment thresholds come up um, from, you know, Oregon, or not Oregon, California information and BC information. And so thresholds really um, have a tendency to be different in whatever region that you're in. And if you're following them to the letter, um, it tends to lead to overtreatment and more problems with disrupting, you know, disruption caused by insecticides. Uh, there's going to be a lot of variability in pest management uh, practices. So, you know, differences between farms of how they have, you know, what markets that they're selling to and the thresholds based off of that. The, grower the growing approach, field size, field age, all of those things factor in. Uh, one of the main things to think about, though, is actions for these pests really needs to be done before the damage is visible. Um, so either you're looking at routinely um, scouting the field to get some type of advanced warning and know what you're looking out for, uh, or have some type of preventative measures like a calendar-based program for your management otherwise. Obviously, um, natural controls uh, on a potential plant or pest species uh, tend to be disrupted by insecticides that have been applied for a separate secondary pest. Um, so secondary pest outbreaks tend to happen um, and are fairly likely. At the end of the day, I can't stress this enough, especially with such a long season that day neutrals have you need to rotate chemistries all season long. Um, you think that you have an issue now with trying to manage these insects uh, and rotating um, through the season, but think of how much more of a problem you're going to have if you are uh, noticing resistance showing up in these pests. Uh, it's a totally different ball game. Lagus bug in uh, California, for example, spotted wing drosophila is uh, also a problem. So we need to be thinking about that at the very beginning of each season and throughout it. So let's get into some detail here. Thrips, these are tiny little critters. They're yellow tan colored. They have wings. They move usually through wind though. Um, they overwinter as adults in the, the plant base in the detritus. They cause uh, misshapen blossoms. Uh, typically, you'll see more of a bronze fruit appearance due to them sucking on floral cells. The lifespan or the life cycle can happen within two weeks. So you think of that over a full day neutral production season and you've got multiple, multiple generations in a season. And the other thing too, I'm, I'm referring usually what I'm finding is the, the Western flower thrips. Um, and there's hundreds of hosts for this particular insect. So movement from host to host to host in a season uh, is extremely common. The biological, cultural control side of things, um, beneficial insects, though there's not as much research done on this, my new pirate bug, lacewing, they factor into suppressing the population a bit. Um, uh, 
when you there's the thought of adding an alternate post to the perimeter of a field um, around the field but when you're thinking about it from a, a day neutral production standpoint you really want to make sure that that bloom that's happening with that alternate host lasts much longer than the full production and post harvest of your day neutral field which can be really difficult um, Cool and wet weather typically suppresses populations. And uh, there's been some research done on reflective mulches, uh, grays, yellow, uh, grays or whites or um, silver colored mulches for planting into because it interferes with the ability for thrips to locate the plants and the flowers. So um, this, and I've read a little bit of research here, but this seems to be something that is more applicable to a younger field you know because by the second season the plant canopy is pretty much taking over more than 50 percent of that that plastic mulch so you're not going to have uh the same benefits as when the canopies are still small and there's a lot of mulch visible to do that job i want to point this out a little bit this there's no like hard research that i'm pulling up here with regards to minute pirate bug but uh, this past season, um, scouting through uh, a few strawberry fields, I noticed that flowers that had this little tiny insect here, and uh, you can see a couple of thrips um, up along here, that's my new pirate bug. And when you saw these insects within uh, bloom, you would, I would easily count half the amount of thrips on those blooms versus other blooms right next to it that would have double the amount. So it was fairly consistent through the season. Of course, the insecticides that we're using to manage thrips or SWD or Ligus bug did bring this population down as well. Um, but in general, um, and again, the farm that I was on, you know, had a, a fairly intensive integrated pest management program. Um, and so over time, you definitely could see multiple times where the, this population was reestablished. So, um, so that was something interesting that I noticed. Chemical control wise, uh, again, talking about thresholds in Oregon, I've seen, you know, growers basically uh, be uh, okay, relatively speaking, with 15 thrips per flower. Um, but in California, usually that's closer to seven. Um, before management, you know, thresholds happen. Uh, so this is difficult to manage. Uh, so obviously monitoring this insect through the season is important, as I've said. Um, using a yellow sticky card out there to um, attract the, the thrips to it. Shaking flowers onto a light colored surface uh, to see how many thrips come off of the, the flower. Uh, I also have, you know, been able to count them with a hand lens by uh, just directly on the flower, I pull off a bloom, uh, one of the petals, and then count, you know, clockwise around the that to the that point again to just get a you know just average number of thrips per bloom that way in a site. Um, pesticide options, obviously, choosing the the insect most insect specific least toxic route. Um, but, you know, contact insecticides, pyrethrin, spinosads, those are usually fairly good at suppressing thrips. Moving on to Ligus bug, this, this is a little bigger of an insect. Um, it's pretty distinct uh, brown, usually brown colored, found in, in uh, the fields or t light green colored as well. But that really distinct triangular V on the, the top of the back is pretty, uh, pretty good marking for looking at it. Um, it overwinters as adults as well. The, both the adults and nymphs feed on the buds, blooms, and um, small fruit. They will usually um, puncture and suck the cells out of this, the seeds. And then uh, the fruit cells behind those seeds typically, typically will start to pucker and cause, you know, misshapen fruit or cat face fruit. I have actually a picture of that in the next slide. Um, there's usually three generations a year. Uh, that's between June and September. 
Um, this is a picture of a nymph here, and you can see those really distinct, well, you can't really see, this isn't a great picture. Um, obviously, photography is not my area of interest, but um, there's little, little black dots on this, this nymph. Uh, they're extremely fast-moving insects, uh, and so with that, and in addition to the fact that they do have multiple host species as well, this population's ability from moving uh, with one host finishing up to the next host is, is really significant. Um, so from the biological, cultural con control perspective, um, beneficial insects, parasitoid wasps, damsel bugs, minute pirate bugs, spiders, uh, all have the ability to suppress particularly the nymph stage since it doesn't have wings. Um, but I really can't stress this enough. You need to, as best as possible, because not everybody has, you know, fields adjacent to theirs being their own, um, but try and refrain uh, from planting around fields with alternate hosts uh, uh, around. So clover, definitely a big no-no. Vetch, bean, these, so this is an example here. This, this photo is taken last summer. The, the adjacent uh, uh, field here is clover, and this is a first-year Plasticulture Albion field. I, I, within a week, this, this field went from no ligus bug to this clover field being harvested, and within that week's time, I was seeing seven or eight adults per blossom. They were aggregating into this field. I mean, it was like, you, you blink your eye and they're there. So really think about that. And uh, I mean, if it's a matter of you monitoring kind of the progress of that clover field um, and really getting a game plan so that you could be prepared for what may be happening coming up into your strawberry field is, is definitely a, a must. Some organ production, or organic production rather, use uh, bug vacuums to suck up the lagus bugs. So obviously if you have the equipment for that, uh, that might be a good possibility to use. But please don't do cover crops or between row cover crops of clover or something like that between your plastic culture fields. That's mayhem. Um, chemical controls. So this threshold usually is when the first adult is found, um, particularly in the, the first generation, or when uh, you're finding one adult or nymph per 20 plants. Again, um, managing by scouting this field, you know, these fields often enough um, and thinking about uh, what other applications uh, that you've made um, make a little bit of a difference. When you're monitoring the initial nymph population, it helps you gauge when the adults are going to appear. So sweep netting through the season. Um, also, I, I, I don't know, I guess I've, you know, scouted enough that I can literally go through and before disturbing a plant area and not blinking, I can watch to see once I disturb the plant, what's moving around. But you have to be on it. I mean, these things move, like I said, as soon as you blink, they're like gone and you, you haven't noticed them. Some degree day modeling um, has been pulled together for managing this. That's more of a first generation type of, of control. Um, when you have multiple generations starting to overlap each other, the degree, degree day models aren't as effective. Pesticide-wise, um, again, the young nymph stage is a little easier to manage. Contact insecticides like bifenthrin and malathion um, are, are labeled for this. And insect growth regulators like Rymon are helpful in early season to manage the initial threat populations as well. Spotted wing drosophila, I really don't feel like I need to talk about this too, too much, but it's... Uh, it's a damaging, it has damaging potential in day neutral production. It's a vinegar fly type and it uh, hones in on ripening fruit. The males have black spots on the tip of their, each of their wings. Uh, females have the ability to lay 
lay hundreds of, of fruit or eggs rather in ripening fruit rather than overripe fruit. And they, this is because they have a saw light overpositor that um, they are able to use by puncturing. Um, they also have a three to four week lifetime. So when those eggs are laid, the larvae that come out of those feed for about five to seven days, um, I usually, before pupating. Uh, so this means that there are plenty of generations happening uh, by the end of the season. Um, they overwinter as adults, uh, usually uh, going into kind of a diapause. And then the populations move from, uh, you know, as the production, especially with fruit, um, on your farm uh, is happening. So culturally, there's, you know, high risk, low risk, uh, and, you know, shades of gray in between all of this. But um, from a low risk perspective, if you're going into a season that you've just um, went through hard winter freezes, um, you, the chances of having that population die back over that winter are really high. So that lowers your risk right away. Um, of course, things like, you know, the 2018 season, the previous winter was nice and mild. And so we saw that pressure building much quicker um, in 2018 than, than we did otherwise. Before July, um, typically has a little less of a risk, so we don't as often have this problem in June strawberry production. Um, temperatures above 80 Fahrenheit, the uh, females are not able to uh, reproduce as quickly, um, but any of the temperatures that are below 80 consistently, they, they love those conditions. They uh, love to multiply in those conditions. Um, anything that's low humidity, dry, uh, exposed, and, and again, that is to the advantage of a strawberry because usually they're pretty exposed fruit to the sun every day, um, and so that lowers the risk. But then you get into a, you know, overhead irrigated or, you know, wet humidity, high humidity or under hoop houses later into the fall or um, fruit being sh shaded tend to, uh, you know, boost up that risk a little bit. Chemical controls of this, um, you guys have all heard about this, but again, like this varies year to year. Putting some traps out in the beginning of the season uh, to see what we're working with to start the season is helpful. Um, I, I swear, these, these adults love to party or something because the amount of red wine and apple cider vinegar that we um, you know, use in a growing season to put into these traps, I'm sure the people that think that we're buying this ball think that we're all alcoholics or something. Um, but it is an effective attraction for the adults. Uh, when the fruit starts coming on, they um, ha there's a salt solution that you can use. It's one cup of salt to one gallon of water. Um, putting a representative sample of ripening fruit in uh, every week and then basically letting it sit in there for a couple hours, wiggles the larva out of the fruit so that you can assess what's going on in the field that way. Again, many generations in the season. So um, it obviously, the later in the season, the lower the management threshold. Um, Bifrenthrin, uh, malathion, spinosad, spinetotrum, um, all have uh, effective uses for managing this. Um, but I do think that there needs to be fruit sampling that's happening on a weekly basis to make sure that your management is effective. Um, that's really, really important for this. Uh, last insect here, two-spotted spider mite. I mean, you know, this is all pretty basic at this point. Uh, eight legs, they have the two characteristic spots, they overwinter as adults. Um, populations are going to uh, explode, usually during dusty, dry, uh, hot conditions. So again, that plays more into uh, day nurture production because uh, the time of year is uh, typically uh, with those conditions. Um, they're found on the underside of leaves, usually starting with the older leaves. 
uh, and they usually have webbing um, that they kind of uh, migrate in and out of uh, laying their eggs. So culturally and biologically, uh, these are, you know, usually more susceptible to having um, infestations when there's uh, an earlier season or a young planting. Um, you, yeah, usually younger plantings, I tend to notice it a little bit more, but not always. And of course, this is like a common thing for flare-ups to happen because of management of another insect um, that you're, you're trying to look after within a field. This is almost the usual thing that happens is the two-spotted spider might flare up at that time. So one of the main things that I would suggest is following the predator mite um, populations as well as the two-spotted uh, adult and egg populations um, each week or as you're able to. So um, the other thing too is you do have access to purchase, you know, predator mites or lady beetle populations and release them early in the spring so that they can um, you know, boost up their generations by the time, um, you know, two spotted are there to, uh, they're able to compete at that point. So chemical uh, management wise, you're inspecting the older leaves, like I'd mentioned with a hand lens, uh, the, the threshold on the Pacific Northwest uh, Insect Management Guide, it talks about 20 to 25 adults per leaf um, is the threshold. And that seems, there, there's a lot of other things that are dependent um, on that, and it, that seems fairly low to me. Um, the ratio of mites to predators that you're finding factor in to, to making this decision. And the adult versus egg count, if you have, um, if you have, you know, no real eggs showing up, but plenty of adults, um, the risk is a little bit lower than um, if you had, you know, many more eggs um, found on there because you know that that cycle is, is rolling. So keeping that in mind, as well as weather conditions that I talked about earlier, so, and, and secondary pest outbreaks. So um, several miticides are labeled for use here, uh, but really you want to know what, what mode of action or what um, form of this insect you're needing to target because some of these uh, are labeled are for only two uh, applications a season. And so if you want to be, you know, only using this for adults, which you have the majority of in the field at the time, um, that's going to be a little different of a product than when you would use if you want to get rid of the eggs as well. So just thinking of it from that uh, perspective. So with that, I'll end there. Um, and I do want to mention, like I did earlier about the Fresh Market newsletter, um, this is sent out uh, quarterly. It's for strawberry-related projects that we've been doing. Um, I know that we have a grower trial, so, um, and that also, there'll be plantings happening in Washington this year. So um, there'll be some information coming up on that, as well as the Oregon trials that are happening there. You can go ahead and sign up by either um, sending me an email or um, typing this, this little URL in and filling out the form to submit. Um, but I do want to thank the, the Washington Specialty Crop Block Grant that we've been um, using uh, as part of this, this workshop today. So I can open it up for questions if you guys have any. I think I have a few minutes left. I don't know. Thanks. Hi, Julie. Hi, Tracy. Just a couple questions about spotted wing. Uh, you mentioned a wine vinegar bait. Uh, can you tell us what the ratio is? It's 50-50, and we, um, it's Carlo Rossi red, it's a white wine? It's a white wine, sorry. It's a white wine. It's a white wine. My bad. I'm sorry. Um, it's easier to see. Yeah. And yeah, so 50-50 ratio of that with apple cider vinegar. But you want to make sure, of course, that the apple cider vinegar is actually made with apples and that it's not corn-based ingredients, which is difficult. It's tricky mm. to find, actually. Second question is, what traps do you use? 
We use, what's the brand name of the trap that we use? I can get you that information. And it's a little bit larger. I don't know what they yeah like, what they're selling it as the brand name of it. Uh, just... Actually, we we get, we've gotten them custom made by by uh, Henry Winkler, I believe is his name. Cause, but it, it but obviously there... it is it's not a regular commercial trap, but it's very close to the one you guys originally started out with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we adjusted the whole size some um, in the size of the overall thing, but. It probably isn't the overall recommended trap, as this isn't the overall recommended mix, but we're keeping things consistent over the years, so we're sticking with this system until something really much superior. But we do test the new uh, attractants and other things that come out to kind of calibrate them to our system. But uh, there's, there's lots of variability on trapping systems. So maybe if anybody has one last question, it looks like I only have a minute left. Anybody else? Okay, thank you.